we have so much great content, it's hard to pick, but definitely one of my favorites, given my knowledge of the folks that are on and the topic. We're talking science, data, influence, and humanity, lessons we're learning about earning vaccine confidence, and you're like, you could not have a better crew here to tell you about this. It's going to be led by my esteemed colleague, Barbara Pinto. Barbara is our practice leader for executive communications at Real Chemistry. Also, as she likes to say, recovering journalist, having worked at ABC, PBS, CNBC. Um, she's just a great person. Everyone on this call is a great person. I'm not the one you want to hear and see right now, so I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. Thank you, panelists, and uh, I'm going to sit back and watch. Thanks, Aaron, for that terrific introduction, and good morning to you all. Thank you for joining us this morning for our conversation. Uh, I want to introduce you to our panelists in just a moment, but let's set the scene first. Just over a year ago, a virus no one had ever seen before called COVID-19 began taking its deadly toll on the world. And now, just a matter of months later, we have three available vaccines in the United States. As of this morning, 113 million doses of the vaccine have been administered. That is great news, and it's a good start. That means only 12% of the U.S. population is fully vaccinated at this point. We know that Black and Brown communities were hit hardest by this pandemic, but recent polling shows the vaccination rate for Black Americans is half that of whites, and the gap for Hispanic communities is even larger. We know that vaccines can only do their life-saving work inside the human body, and the critical gap to having a vaccine in a vial and getting vaccinated is trust. So where do we stand when it comes to vaccine confidence? What are the biggest barriers? And what are we learning about bridging those gaps? To answer those questions, we're joined by some powerful voices from the front lines of the fight against COVID. Judy Sewards, head of clinical trial experience at Pfizer, the developer with BioNTech of the first mRNA vaccine for COVID-19. Dr. Reed Tuxen, physician, executive, leader in public health and co-founder of the Black Coalition Against COVID. And Sandra Lindsay, Director of Critical Care Nursing at Long Island Jewish Hospital. You might recognize her from the cover of every single newspaper and website in the country as the first person in America to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Welcome to you all. Sandra, I wanna start with you. I don't know about, Judy and I were saying we both cried when we saw you getting that vaccine, that photo, that moment symbolized what we all hoped would be the beginning of the end of the pandemic. As an intensive care nurse in a COVID hotspot, talk about what that moment meant to you getting that vaccine and what you hoped it would mean to others. Good morning and thank you for having me. After months of um, just witnessing extreme suffering, death, by patients, their families, or staff. I could not believe on December 14th that a vaccine had come to market so rapidly, came to save us when we needed it the most, and that I was sitting in that chair and having that needle pierce my arm. It represented for me a beginning to the end of a very dark time in our history. It signified that healing is finally coming, that hope is here. It, it just signified so much for me, preservation of life, um, abilities for others to be able to get that same feeling and recover their livelihoods and, and save lives. And I could not, I, I just couldn't wait for that needle to pierce my arm. That's, you don't often hear people say they are excited to get a shot, but we all experienced that watching you do that. And Judy, that speed, this was the first mRNA vaccine ever, brought to patients in nothing short of a miraculous timeline, months instead of years. Take us back to those early days enrolling those first human trials. What was it like doing that, getting patients or volunteers to essentially take a leap of faith and what learnings from that experience might help us build vaccine confidence today? Sure, um, thank you. Um, and, and Sandra, it's so nice to, to see you. I think it's just 
you know, here we are today versus reflecting back um, during that time. Um, but I think it's, you know, in the spring of last year, we as an organization um, were steadfastly focused. We knew the responsibility that was on our shoulders um, to, to potentially um, bring a solution uh, to this pandemic. And I think um, there are a few things that we've learned um, along the way as, as we go forth. Um, I think number one is just having science be our guide. Um, and be really focused on our science. You know, we've, we've had the mantra, science will win. And, and, you know, our CEO has come out and talked a lot about the science, but it was critically important for us to follow every single step that we normally would in any other trial um, and ensure that um, we maintain the highest quality standards that we would um, for any trial. Um, and a key part of that, I think, is um, participants and participant safety. So, you know, we on the team, as we work together every day, um, the participants were, um, were our guide um, in ensuring that um, we were taking into consideration their perspectives, as well as um, you know, what this all really meant for them. Um, and it meant a, a few things. I think one is um, you know, we knew from the outset that we wanted to make sure that any COVID vaccine um, candidate was um, really um, available in terms of trials uh, for those communities that were disproportionately impacted um, by the disease as one way um, to advance health equity. And so we took very intentional steps even before the trial began throughout the trial um, to make sure that um, our, our trials were um, inclusive. Now, clinical trial participation is absolutely a personal choice, but I think from Pfizer's perspective, you know, our job was to make sure that um, we made it easier for those who chose to participate to be able to participate. So for example, we reached out um, to clinical trial sites in those communities um, to eliminate transportation or um, barriers to access. And we know that that is a, a barrier for some. Um, and we work closely with our sites to ensure that the local communities, that's where things happen. So the sites um, that we partnered with their staff really, um, we invited them to partner um, with us um, in community engagement um, to really raise awareness about the importance of representation. And I think it happens on that local level. And I think that's a learning that we can take forward as we go. And then lastly, I think just transparency. We were in a unique situation where people were asking, you know, what is your trial about? Where are you conducting it? How is it progressing? And so we made efforts to really um, be very forthcoming, speak with organizations um, who were interested and share um, you know, on our, our public website, here's our clinical trial plan, here are some frequently asked questions um, to really break it down for those who um, you know, were interested and wanted to know, and then really say, here's how many people we've enrolled, here are the demographics by age, race, ethnicity, as we progress, and I think, you know, those three things, which is, you know, sticking with the science, engaging your communities and being transparent are all lessons that we can bring forward today, you know, outside of the trial, the trial progresses, but that's the work that we need to do together. Dr. Tufson, let's turn to you. I know in spite of all of this, we are seeing skeptics and deep pockets of resistance and hesitancy in communities of every color. What do we know about who is hesitant and what do we know about the why? There are a, a number of American uh, population subgroups that are concerned about, uh, about the, the vaccine and have their own questions. Let's start and remember the most important thing. It's okay to have questions. Uh, it's a rational thing to have questions, but it is also important uh, that we have experts who can address those questions. And that's why the Black Coalition Against COVID contains uh, this army of black health leaders and black health professionals who have credibility who can speak to the issues. For the African-American community, specifically to your point, um, there has been, a, obviously, uh, our experience in America has been one that of distrust. Uh, obviously, this has been a fraught relationship people of color have had with our society. And there are deeply ingrained concerns and anxieties in terms of our relationship to the overall society. We all know and are aware, I'm sure, of the Tuskegee syphilis study, uh, which uh, was involved in the 1930s, where people with this disease of syphilis were, were denied treatment. 
uh, for the disease so that people could study the natural history of syphilis throughout the human body. This was an outrageous experience and one that lives very deeply um, in the souls of, of, of people of color in this country. And unfortunately, those seeds are watered every day by our contemporary experience. And we see things like Black Lives Matter and other sorts of, of, of protests that signified to the significance of this sense of I am not recognized for my dignity, for my worth, that my life doesn't seem to have value. But it's not just the African-American community that we're seeing this, uh, uh, Barbara. We're seeing it also, for example, one of the largest groups, if not the largest groups of vaccine hesitancy today are, 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 are white Republicans. And so there are issues there as we are seeing in our country, the erosion in the confidence in science deliberately manipulated uh, erosion by outrageous attacks on the F on the uh, on the uh, on, on Dr. Fauci, uh, on the FDA and on the CDC. Uh, these were very hurtful and very damaging. The good news is, though, I think that we will continue to mount uh, a response that has truth and expertise, uh, listening very carefully uh, to the concerns and then responding with facts and truth over and over again. Now, you raise an important point there. There is so much misinformation. People believing the vaccine can implant a computer chip or changes your DNA, causes infertility, all of these wild theories, none of them based in truth. Talk about how you're seeing, and Sandra, you're on the front lines, so I, I want to hear from you here. Uh, how are you dealing with these kinds of misinformation? How do we reach people who actually believe this? So unfortunately, disparities in, um, say, education, uh, how people receive information and process information uh, affects communities of color, the people who are mostly resistant. So we need to get ahead of that by providing facts, breaking it down to people in ways that they understand, not using um, medical terms we need bad information, misinformation travels fast. We need to go faster than those informations. information. Getting into the community with partnering with trusted leaders, cultural leaders, faith-based leaders within the communities that people trust to be messengers, deliver those messages, um, providing education in, using different different forms of education because people learn differently. So print information, social media, perhaps setting up hotlines within communities where people who live within the community and are, who are experts on these topics can, um, can staff those areas for people to be able to go to, to get information instead of going on social media and listening to conspiracy theories. We have to, what I do when I hear them, I listen and I provide the facts. I dispel those rumors. I share my experiences that myself and my nurses and so many other people are experiencing on the front lines. And I would uh, augment that with uh, those very important points with uh, our experience with the Black Coalition Against COVID is that when we do speak with trusted voices, physician experts who come of and from the community itself, all of us who live the experience of the audience itself and have now become professionals because of our concern and empathy and compassion for our community. When those voices are presented, it has a significant impact. And our polling is showing us that the flipping now from uh, a few months ago with 70% of the African American community estimated to not be in favor of being vaccinated, now it's just the opposite. And so while we still have work to go, that's important. But the thing, Barbara, I wanna emphasize to this audience in particular, and what I think is important for this audience to pay attention to, is that we've got to help America now begin a love embrace with science. It is amazing to me that all of these fantastic scientific breakthroughs, I mean, I am so impressed to hear Judy talk about the journey that Pfizer took. Why would people say, oh my God, I am concerned that you did what you did so fast, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying, my God, the human mind, the human intelligence, the human capacity for learning, for evolving, for innovation is a celebratory thing. We have got to find a way to, after this pandemic is over, and it is, we're, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, 
We're going to have to go back, Barbara, and have a conversation with America about embracing science and not letting the conspiracy theories that Sandra so eloquently talked about, let those become more important than the human genius. From your mouth to God's ears, Dr. Tuxley, I, I, I would like to just, Judy, uh, shift the conversation to you, knowing that we've never seen this level of collaboration in pharma. We have yeah. never seen this coming together of the minds that is, it has given us such a miraculous result. Knowing vaccination efforts like this are as much about the human body as they are now about hearts and minds. Uh, how will that change our approach to medicine and possibly even public health going forward? Uh, how do you see the way forward from here? Well, I think, um, you know, building on what Dr. Tuxin has spoken about, um, I think in America, around the world, no one has, people are much more aware of um, the scientific process, the discovery process, et cetera. Um, as we go forward. And I think um, we as an industry have also learned a lot about where we need to meet people. Um, you know, we know our process, we know, you know, and we do it as for a living, but I think we need to do a better job of educating um, people it, everywhere about, um, you know, what it takes um, to develop a medicine or a vaccine um, and really put it in language where we are meeting people where they are, right? For me, I'm like phase one, phase two, phase three. Oh, it's super clear. Or here's what an informed consent document looks like. Or this is the process by which, um, you know, a person can become aware and get involved um, in research. And so for me, you know, one of the things that um, I, I'm really committed to um, personally and I know our organization is, is how do we increase awareness and access and make medicine and science much more accessible early on. I think, you know, there's a lot of education out there about medicine after it's approved or, um, you know, as, as a treatment option. But I also think um, this awareness about clinical trials and education is something critically important that we need to do because I think participation um, should be a right for anybody who chooses to do so. And so I think the work that we need to do, um, you know, as an industry, and then I think the learnings we've had as a company is how do we break it down into language? How do we make it easier for, for people to participate um, a, as needed? And I think that's, that's, I think, the next horizon as, as we think about it. You raise such a great point because I think people are missing the magic of the medicine uh, simply sometimes because of the words or the language we're using. Uh, polls have shown that uh, terms like emergency use authorization were actually making people fearful uh, that these vaccines had been rushed through. So in doing that, I mean, do we need to really think about how we communicate? How much of this, uh, Dr. Tuxin, do you think you know, hinges on the language we use to describe this, perhaps being more patient-centric. One of the major lessons that we have learned is the importance of the messenger, uh, the importance of the language, and the importance of the approach. All three are critical. And so, for example, if people, to, to be able, to, we've learned that, that it is okay to say to people, it's okay to have questions. That is a big breakthrough for us in terms of communication, because instead of saying, well, my gosh, you're you're dumb or you're 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 not sophisticated or you're not literate or you're not reading. No, it's good to have questions and you should ask them. That's what an intelligent person does. Secondly, what are the ways in which we engage? We have learned how important it is to start with empathy, with compassion. And so one of the key learnings from the Black Coalition Against COVID has we did out and we put out with the help of our colleagues at W2O a love letter to Black America. And the first words were, dear Black America, we love you. That was a key learning for us. Third, it is that we start to, to, to get underneath to listening to what people are saying. And we heard that earlier, listening to what people are saying, and then using the phrases that speak to what is really on people's mind and what their emotional triggers are. And so what I would conclude, Barbara, is that what, what, what is so important and what I think is so exciting about parts of this pandemic has been the recruitment into the healthcare system 
experts from the communication world in a way that we've never seen before. We have so many bright organizations who make their living communicating, and now they have deputized themselves or become deputized as part of the health team. And I think that is really something that now we will never be able to go back away from. I think we will always now have communication professionals right there with the health delivery team. Sandra, I'm just wondering, in, in your interactions with, with people, with patients, um, how has your communication changed around educating people? Uh, have you found that, uh, you know, you, you need to spend more time or just what does that look like? And what are the answers in terms of convincing folks? Is it hearing from a doctor, a nurse, someone who looks like you? Is it going on a website? Is it just old fashioned person to person contact? So as, as Dr. Tuxen and Judy have mentioned, um, what we've learned is uh, we need to listen to people. We need to listen to what their concerns are. We need to acknowledge that their fears are real. And again, to reiterate, can't say that enough, Dr. Tuxen, is for people to ask questions. That's how you become educated. We need to spend time listening to people and um, educating them, dispelling myths. The word of mouth still remains very powerful and encouraging people who have gotten vaccinated from the communities or outside of the communities, um, encouraging people who have had experiences of having COVID or having a family member have COVID-19 and recovering from it and providing testimonials engaging those people in helping us to rally the communities and to educate is also very powerful. But spending time with people to understand and not just saying to people, go to our website, I think is very, very important. You know, you raise an interesting point there. It's that one-on-one -on -one kind of person-to-person -person communication. Judy, I'm wondering from your perspective, what is the role of industry in driving vaccine confidence. Um, you know, where, what is Pfizer's role in terms of making choices to contribute and where do you believe Pfizer should step back and let others communicate? Sure. Um, I think, you know, obviously um, we've all learned that bringing um, a potential vaccine um, to society isn't enough. Um, and, you know, we need to have people who are who trust in vaccines as well are willing to to take vaccines. And I think um, that's that's a very personal choice. But um, you know, at Pfizer, we think public education is critical. And that public education um, to increase awareness about um, the importance of vaccination is 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 done in great partnership with patient organizations, medical and public health institutions. And so, you know, we we think it's a, a big part of our responsibility, and we're taking many steps to help educate about the importance of vaccination. So we are activating multiple channels, and including direct to consumer um, as well. Um, but also supported um, the creation of a U.S. advocacy coalition, for example. So the COVID-19 vaccine education equity project. And, you know, as Sandra and, and Dr. Cookson highlighted, listening and having a dialogue is so critically important. And um, the goal is really to convene a dialogue amongst those organizations that represent those constituencies that have been impacted by COVID um, that are on the front lines of the pandemic. And, and really work together. So I think, um, you know, our responsibility is to partner um, with trusted organizations and those who represent various constituents, but also, you know, do our part um, as well. Um, you know, we have our own multicultural health equity collective um, and we're working um, with some of our partners there, but our goal is really how can we raise awareness, build confidence and ultimately um, reduce health disparities um, across the board. So. Thank you. Now this is time for our lightning round. It's a very quick last question for each of you. Um, so you are given 30 seconds to make a vaccine public service announcement broadcast to every single household in America. Sandra, what would you say? I would say to the public, 
COVID-19 is not a hoax. Your best defense at getting your best defense against getting severely ill and potentially dying from COVID-19 is to get vaccinated. It does not matter if you get the J&J &J vaccine, Pfizer or Moderna, all will protect you for, from becoming severely ill and potentially dying. Judy? Um, so I'll take a, a little bit of more of a scientific and perspective. Um, I think vaccines have saved many lives. Um, they're the one of the best tools that society has um, within public health to keep um, diseases at bay. Um, you know, as we work to develop our COVID-19 vaccine, safety was our number one priority. Um, and we work closely with our sites, regulatory agencies around the world to ensure that we met the highest quality and safety standards um, throughout the development program. Um, and I would say, you know, we followed strict rules to make sure participants are safe throughout. For example, um, our protocols were approved by independent review boards, institutional review boards for our, um, their entire focus is to ensure that um, participants are not exposed to unnecessary risks. Um, we monitored our trial um, closely ourselves and by an independent data monitoring committee. And their job was really to ensure that if we saw that the vaccine wasn't working, or if there were um, um, harming participants that we would stop the trial. Um, and you know we're continually committed to safety. Our investigators are closely monitoring our individual participants. The trial is ongoing for um, additional two years. So you know our analysis as well as the FDA found that there are no specific safety concerns. And so you know that would be um, my PSA. I think that might have been more than 30 seconds, but really just yeah. kind of highlighting <laughs> the key aspects within the system. Um, that um, are important um, as, as we develop vaccines. Great. Dr. Tuxen? Dear American household, uh, would you like to get your life back? Do you want your kids to go back to school safely? Would you like to protect your small businesses? Do you want to make sure you have a job? Do you want your kids to have their senior prom and be able to graduate in front of all of the family? Do you want to have Christmas and do you want to have Thanksgiving as a loving family? You can't do it unless we get vaccinated, each and every one of you. The vaccines are safe. It's been proven to be safe, and they work effectively. Let's get our lives back. Today's the day. Drop the mic. Thank you so much for <laughs> wrapping us up. <laughs> Finally <laughs> drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a few questions. I just want to make sure we get to uh, one quickly. Oh, just Go ahead, Barbara. Sorry, I came on after that. I was so inspired by Dr. Tux, and I couldn't help it. But go oh, ahead no. and maybe grab a question or so. Yeah, I, I just we'll, we'll just uh, quickly run through one of the questions. We've got just a few here, but what role did Black physicians play in creating some of the communications that are uh, rolling out to communities of color? Black physicians were very intimately uh, connected in that process, thank goodness. And we worked not only with uh, our colleagues at W2O, but also with the Ad Council and Kaiser Family Foundation. Each and every one of those we have been co-sponsors with and so intimately involved with them, learning from and teaching them. We will leave it there after the drop the mic moment. And uh, I, I thank you all so very much for being powerful voices and for lending your time to us. Um, I am hoping that with the benefit of science, we will all see each other in person next year in Austin for South by Southwest. Thank you to this incredible panel.